Welcome up! In this episode, we will talk about the relationship of politics with power to understand whether there is an antidote to its corrosive effects. Coming up. Hello, I'm Understanding Politics, and in this channel I explain political theories and debates to students as well as curious and passionate people, just like you. So if you like the content of the channel, consider subscribing. According to the political scientist David Easton, politics can be defined as an authoritative allocation of values to a society. A political system is in fact composed by three main elements, a political community, a regime, and authorities. The political community is a group of people exposed to a set of institutions, norms and rules, in one word, to a regime, decided by the political power, the authorities. In this sense, these two actors, namely the political community and authorities, interact and influence each other through the regime in a system of inputs and outputs. As you can see, while the system seems balanced, the object of politics unbalances it. In fact, politics deals, although not exclusively, with power, and this explains most of nowadays debacles in the political landscape. Possibly one of the most popular quotations that you can find on the internet says, power tends to corrupt, absolute power corrupts absolutely. It seems like this quotation is attributed to a British historian of the 19th century called John Dalberg Acton. I mean, Tolkien warned us, isn't this what Gollum is all about? NERD! If you watched the past video on Thomas Hobbes and the function of states, then you realize that political authorities dispose of a concentrated form of power that would allow them to realize even their most secret wishes. Of course, the more power is concentrated, the more it becomes dangerous for the very own political community that conceived it and allowed it. But it is also true that the more power is concentrated, the easier it is to achieve goals that a person alone cannot reach. The dangers of power concentration have been addressed in 1748 by Charles-Louis de Seconda, Baron de la Brede de Montesquieu, Montesquieu for France, a French philosopher and writer in his most important political work, L'Esprit de Loi, The Spirit of Laws. At the time of the publication of this book, France was ruled by Louis XV, a supporter of absolute monarchy as his great-grandfather and predecessor, Louis XIV. For these reasons, L'Esprit de Loi can be considered a critique destined not only to oriental despotisms, but also to the France of that time. Still, this book inspired the founding fathers of the United States even more than the participants to the French Revolution. Among the key passages of this book, there is the theory of the separation of powers. Resting on the idea that a power can be limited only by another power, Montesquieu suggested that the power of the state had to be divided and administered by different entities that would monitor each other in the exercise of their functions. These powers are of course the legislative, the executive and the judiciary powers, exercised respectively by the parliament, government and judiciary. When the system was conceived, the legislative power was rightly believed to be the most important, because it sets out the basic rules of the society. But over time, with the requirement to have more rapid system of legislations, parliament and government started to exercise the legislative power in conjunction. This is true even for a supranational organization such as the European Union, where the parliament and the commission share the legislative initiative. Instead, the expression fourth power or fourth estate refers to an idea attributed to the British political philosopher Edmund Burke that used this expression to identify the press, the media, and today we could even add social media, and their capability to frame the political discussions, hence affecting the perception of citizens. The expression is very common in a number of European languages, including German, Wirte Gewalt, Spanish, Quarto Poder, French, Quatrième Pouvoir, and in Italian, Quarto Poder. That God forbid, we don't know why, it's also the Italian title of 
Orson Welles' movie Citizen Kane. While it is undoubtedly true that media have a strong influence on the capability of citizens to exercise their rights, the fourth estate is not technically a power, but rather a set of lenses that facilitates, hinders or distorts its exercise. So, to reconnect the definition of politics given by David Easton to the philosophy of Thomas Hobbes and to the introduction of many constitutions worldwide, the source of power is the people that entrust said power to a set of institutions, a regime, where authorities will exercise part of this power to perform social duties or come up with solutions to widespread social problems. I use the word entrust consciously because the relationship between the electorate and the elected rests on the value of trust. And this is why the media have the fundamental duty to help the electorate to keep politicians and authorities in general in constant check. In conclusion, Montesquieu's separation of power is the solution envisaged to prevent the state to become the terrible monster presented by Ops. So whenever you hear a politician asking for full powers, you have all the rights to be scared. <coughs> the reference is purely coincidental. Thank you for watching. As always, all the sources will be linked in the references section of this video description. If you liked the video, you know what to do. What the fuck? Power karate. Is that your pretty? This is this is this is. Dalberaka. One of my favorite quotations on power comes from the character of Frank Underwood in Netflix House of Cards. Money is the Mac Mansion in Sarasota that starts falling apart after 10 years. Power is the old stone building that stands for centuries. I cannot respect someone that doesn't see the difference.